everybody. It's uh, again my pleasure to welcome you for In Conversation. Uh, today is the first in our series about time. Um, you know, December, we always uh, think about the back um, past 12 months. I think this thing, this year, we're going to have a lot to think about and uh, chew on a um, lot, I think, of um, world events, but we've all discovered a lot about ourselves in um, what has been very much confinement, isolation, cut off, and uh, communication via screens. So I started thinking about that concept of time and um, I thought it would be interesting to see how time is entering into the craft world and how it's represented in the craft world. Uh, the, the concept of time for makers is very different from um, the rest of, of us. Um, they just need to have a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to create beautiful craft. And makers and artists always seem to be a little bit out of the normal time. They always seem to have their own time zone, their own time space, I find. Uh, so I thought it would be good to start with a lecture. Today is going to be slightly different rather than a, a conversation. It will be more of a lecture. And I asked Bill Sterling, uh, who is a historian, to talk to us today about the concept of time. So I met Bill via his uh, wife, who is a spectacular jewelry collector. I had the privilege of um, going to the house and viewing their collection, her collection of jewelry and it's thousands of pieces um, and it's brooches. So I put today a brooch from uh, a British uh, jeweler, Jed Green, and um, uh, I thought it had a little bit of a dial. I didn't have anything related to time. Normally, I always try to have a piece of jewelry that is related to the topic of the conversation. But today, I didn't have anything related to time other than, uh, than a wristwatch. But I thought this one with the circles uh, reminded me a little bit of um, a clock um, uh, mechanic. So... Um, so uh, Bill Sterling is a historian. He has a PhD in Anglo-Saxon history at King's College and he lectures at the British Museum. He's one of the uh, very rare um, uh, specialist uh, tour guide at the British Museum. He also lectures at the National Maritime Museum Queen's House in Greenwich, which is a, a spectacular place. And Greenwich College Bexley Adult Education College, Morley College, and the City Lit. So Bill, thank you so very much for um, being with us today. And I think that we're going to start talking about the concept of time throughout uh, the ages and civilizations. And then we're going to go specifically to the uh, clocks of the British Museum, which is almost like your second home, I think. <laughs> yes, that's right. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, yes, this is well said. I, I, I lecture at the British Museum, but also at the, the City Lit, which is very close to the British Museum. And I've been a, a lecturer there for 12 years and a, a volunteer a guide at the British Museum for 26 years. So I know the British Museum pretty well. And this talk is largely based on the objects in the British Museum, which has just reopened again after a period of lockdown we've had again in London. Um, but the clock gallery is not open at the moment, it's only the ground floor that's open. Right. Uh, just I'll share my screen now, and I've got quite a few slides, more on the, the second part of this talk when I'm talking about the particular clocks, but there's a bit on the sort of general talk as well, so I'll, I'll share the screen with you now. Those of you who don't know the British Museum, that's the entrance to the British Museum, and uh, this is a few years ago when quite a few of the volunteers, some are guides, some are, are volunteer at hands-on desks and others volunteer to help with uh, parties and that sort of thing, all gathered together and had our photograph taken outside the front. You can see me there. Um, if you go right, almost in the centre, right, right here, that, that's me just there <laughs> with the, the jacket and the white shirt showing underneath, um, just to prove that I was one of those, those guides. Uh, so the idea of time, when Isabel sort of sort of 
discuss this with me. I think it's quite an interesting thing at the moment. And I thought I'd start with a few quotes. Um, one of my favourite novels is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. And at one point he says, time is an illusion. Lunchtime, doubly so. So I don't know if it's lunchtime for anyone uh, joining this. It's not for me here, so let's hope it's the, that's okay. He also elaborated on this by saying, reason notwithstanding, the universe continues unabated. Its history is terribly long and awfully difficult to understand, even in its simplest moments, which are, roughly speaking, the beginning and the end. The wave harmonic theory of historical perception in its simplest form states that history is an illusion caused by the passage of time, but time is an illusion caused by the passage of history. Uh, typical Douglas Adams humor there. Uh, from a more serious point of view, there's a professor John D. Norton at the Center for Philosophy and Science at University of Pittsburgh, who puts it slightly differently. He says, a common belief among philosophers of physics is that the passage of time of ordinary experience is merely an illusion. The idea is seductive since it explains away the awkward fact that our best physical theories of space and time have yet to capture this passage. I urge that we should resist the idea. So he doesn't believe that time is an illusion. Uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, writing around about 400 AD, wrote, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know. If I wish to explain it to one that asketh, I know not. And I think he's, he's quite right there. Um, when you're trying to explain it, it just becomes far more difficult than the, we, we actually know. And going to good old Wikipedia, I thought, let's see what they had to say. Time is the indefinite continued progress of existence and events that occur in an apparently irreversible succession from the past through the present and into the future. I'm not sure if that is terribly helpful, but anyway, we'll, we'll carry on. It seems to become more important during lockdown, as Isabel was saying. Uh, in the UK, we were told before lockdown that we, if we all washed our hands for 20 seconds, and seconds a measure of time, we'd be safe. To do this, we had to sing happy birthdays twice to ourselves to measure 20 seconds, uh, whether it was our birthday or, or whether or not we were happy. We were told that symptoms might not appear for a week, and again, the week's a measure of time. Uh, if they might, then we had to self-isolate for two weeks. Many people who ventured on holiday had to go into quarantine for two weeks when they came back, and whole towns were locked down for a whole month. All these are measures of time, but they're artificial measures of time, and I'll come into that in a moment. Some firms furloughed their staff for so many months. Schools had to go off for so many months and start back at, at a certain point. And these are all artificial measures it's a, that the government was working to. We've all stopped to reflect on our lives as well during this time. Um, but, but, but what we perhaps don't realise is that all measurements, most of the measurements of time are artificial. The only natural measurements of time are the year, the month and the day. And even those we have to have to alter. The day is the time it takes for the Earth to spin around its axis once. The month, the natural month, is the time it takes for the moon to wax and wane, which is roughly 29 and a half days, which is not a very useful measure. The year is the time it takes the Earth to travel around the sun, which is roughly 12 and two fifths months, or 365 and a quarter days. Again, not terribly useful. Uh, the week is a completely human invention, as are the hour, the minute and the second. Um, we have to tweak the month so that it fits in with our, our ideas, um, because it's so difficult to work with this idea of 29 and a half days. The two, tra tra two traditional methods for measuring time, recording time, we use the calendar for periods longer than the, the day, uh, for the week, the month and the year, and we use clocks for periods shorter than the day, hours, minutes and seconds. There's quite strong evidence to suggest that the month and the year were recorded even in the Stone Age. And I've got a couple of images here uh, from the Stone Age. This is a, a picture in the British Museum's picture collection by John Constable of Stonehenge. And it's thought that Stonehenge was a some sort of clock. Uh, at midwinter, 
the sun appears to, to rise above a particular stone. Although modern Druids prefer to celebrate it when it appears on the other side. Oh, of midsummer. course you do. Please do. All right. Um, and even in, even in Wiltshire in southwest England, it's quite slightly warmer in the winter summer than it is in the winter. So you can understand why the modern Druids prefer the, the summer solstice to the winter solstice. And Stonehenge, um, actually, oh. I, I was there in October. Stonehenge is much smaller uh, <laughs> than, than we think. It's actually almost disappointing. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, I mean, I've got a, a the next slide is actually a photo of me there with my, my mother and my sister in 1964. <laughs> uh, the days when you could actually walk around the stones, which was quite nice. But uh, yes, right. it's, it, it seems bigger when you're actually up close to the stones. You sort of get an idea of the scale there. But yes, it is. Uh, when you have to look at it from a distance, it's, it does seem much smaller. Than it is, really. right. Sorry, yeah. I interrupted. No, it's right. no, it's, uh, uh, no, it's fine. Um, um, I just I found this in an old photo album. And I thought it was quite interesting to, to see back in 1964. Um, the but the changes in the season, even to early man, they must have been aware how time progresses over the year, changes the seasons, and also notice the position of the sun. Uh, when it rises and when it sets over time, that it, it seems to move along the horizon at different points. And this is how they, they measured their, their year, worked out how a year worked and how the, the months worked, and realised that it got warmer in the summer and colder in the, the winter, and these were connected to the position of the sun as well. So it's a very early idea, this, this idea of being able to measure time passing as the, the seasons change. Um, and also the amount of daylight, of course, the lower the sun is, the, the, the less daylight there is to carry out the normal tasks that you have, such as farming and hunting and that sort of thing. They must have also noticed that as the seasons changed, animals migrated, animals that they needed to hunt, or things like salmon coming to spawn, or birds uh, behaving. But in some places, of course, there are, are very seasonal spectacular events, like the inundation of the Nile, the River Nile in Egypt, or monsoon season in India, or hurricane season in, in America, and so on. So it's a quite, quite, these sort of events must have been aware to early man, seeing the, the passing of time. But how did they calculate it? Uh, the month is, is a, a very strange idea, and most ancient civilizations seem to have realized that you could have 13 months in the year, with just a few extra days over, but, but People don't like the number 13. It's not easy to work with mathematically. So most ancient civilizations had 12 months of varying length of days, just as we do today. And they sometimes fitted in extra days at the end of the year to, to add on. In America, the Mayan civilization had 18 months of 20 days each, and then five days at the end of the year to try and fit in. So it's a, it's a, a, a very difficult thing to, for people to early people to get a handle on. In 45 BC, Julius Caesar standardized the lengths of months and how, how to calculate the months. And one of the months was changed its name to honor him. So Quintilis became July after Julius Caesar. And his great nephew Augustus changed the following month to August after his name, sort of Sextilis. Uh, the Julian calendar became the standard in Western Europe for about 1600 years until it started to get really out of step with the year because they didn't make allowances for the, for the fact that there were only 365 and a quarter days in the year. And it was Pope Clement the 13th in 1582 who got rid of 10 days to make this fit, the, the year fit better into the seasons. And this became known as the Gregorian calendar. Well, the whole of the Catholic world accepted that, but the Protestants were a bit slow off the mark and this caused some problems. When William of Orange became King of England, King William III in 1688, his native Netherlands had already started to use the Gregorian calendar, but the English were still using the Julian calendar. So they were 10 days apart. It must have made setting up meetings for him very difficult, depending on whether he was in Britain or in, in the Netherlands. You can't imagine having those two calendars working together. And in fact, it wasn't until 1752 the English government accepted the Gregorian calendar, by which time they were 11 days out with the rest of Europe. And when they got rid of these 11 days, there were riots in England 
um, people shouting, give us back our 11 days. They thought the government had made their, their life 11 days shorter, um, which is rather sad, but of course the government ignored them. In Russia, the Gregorian calendar wasn't accepted until 1918 after the Russian Revolution. So it meant in fact that the October Revolution in 1917 actually took place on the 7th of November. And you get that sort of strange quirk in history. The week uh, that we accept today is a completely artificial invention by the Babylonians. About 5,000 years ago, they invented that. Uh, they seem to like the idea of having a weekly worship, but also they, they had seven days of the week after the seven astronomical bodies that they could see in the sky. So it's the, the sun, the moon, the, um, and the, the five main planets, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mercury. And we still use those names for the days of the week in most, most Western countries today, sometimes with a slightly German spin on it. And the week really does regulate our lives to a, to a large extent. We often do things weekly, and it's all thanks to the Babylonians 5,000 years ago. When I was growing up, schools, uh, uh, shops were closed on a Sunday, so you knew that was part of the week. Monday was always wash day, Wednesday was always sports day at school, and Saturday night was always bath night. And if there's anything else you do weekly, it's those Babylonians that you've got to thank for it. It's quite a legacy of ancient Babylon that we still follow the, the weekly routine for ourselves. And when it comes to these shorter measurements of time under the, uh, under the day, um, we come to the horologist, we come to the clock making. And again, it's ancient civilizations who first had the idea of trying to measure the, the passage of time. And one of the, the earliest ways, first ways of doing this was looking at the, the sun crossing the sky. And the idea of a sundial seems to have been started again in ancient Egypt about three and a half thousand years ago. And they used a T-square, which was orientated to the east until dawn and then turned round to orientate it to the to the west for the rest of the day. And they divided the daylight hours into 12 and then the nighttime hours into 12. So the hours were of unequal lengths depending on the time of year and where you were. So you might have longer hours during the day and shorter hours during the night, which is quite an interesting concept. In fact, in Japan, they carried on doing that right until 1873. So when a lot of the early Jesuit missionaries gave them clocks as presents, the Japan, they were totally useless in Japan because they, a clock always tells you equal lengths of hours, and in Japan they didn't have equal, equal lengths of hours, so they were just a, a sort of a show thing, which is quite interesting. Uh, it was the Egyptians also had the idea of dividing the day into 12 at night and 12 during the day. Um, not quite sure why they used the number 12. 12 is a quite a useful number in mathematics. Uh, it divides up quite easily. And they also used the, the three, four, five triangle for getting a, a square. If you remember your Pythagoras theorem from school, the three, four, five triangle is a, 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 a triangle with a right angle. The idea of using base 60, so because we have 60 minutes and 60 seconds, again comes from those Babylonians. And it's about 4,000 years ago that the Babylonians first started using base 60. And they used it for dividing a circle into 360 degrees. And then I say we've adapted it for 60 minutes and 60 seconds. During the French Revolution, they were obsessed with the decimalization. And they actually changed, tried to change uh, the clock into decimals. They had 100 seconds in a minute. 100 minutes in an hour and 10 hours in the day, um, which is a very difficult system to, to work out. So instead of 86,400 seconds in a day, you had 100,000 seconds in the day. Uh, thankfully, Napoleon abolished this and went back to the, the system that everybody else was used to. So I talked about sundials. Um, these are some of the early sundials we've got in the British Museum. One on the left is uh, an Egyptian, part of an Egyptian one uh, made from a for a priest called Achmos, about 200 BC. It's largely missing, but it, the inscription on there does tell us what it's for. And the one on the right is a Greek sundial, and although it's got the nomen, the nomon missing, which was the, the, 
the stick which was poked out here, you can see where the shadow of the sun was measured amongst the over on the, the base of the sundial. We can't date this exactly, but sometime sort of between 480 and 31 BC. Uh, Bill, the, uh, yes. the, the Greeks had two concepts of time, didn't they? They had the concept of the, the quantity of the time, which is, I think, the chronos, but they also had the concept of um, doing something at the right time, didn't they? Yes, that's right, yes. A number of ancient civilizations seem to have had that same sort of concept, yes. Um, chronos was the the, the god of, of time and also the god of old age. So yes, a chronos time in that sense is where we get the, the word the chronology and chronometer from, from chronos. Yes, but yes, as you say, it had the sort of separate idea of the time to do something. Yes, so. Right. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, op right. The, opportune, uh, the opportune moment to do Absolutely. something. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. Which I think is just so relevant um, uh, right now. Yes, we're absolutely. always wondering when is it the right time to do the right thing. What is the right thing to do, um, if nothing else, for you know traveling or for meeting up or for hugging, and which obviously we can't do now. But we're all wondering when is it going to be the right time to do that. Yes, and it's also something that the governments are trying to regulate for us that we we can't we can't just That's decide right. for ourselves. So it even makes it even worse, more difficult. It's just a few more um, sundials here from, from the museum's collection. There's a Roman one on the left, uh, made from rather nice marble with these rather fun lion faces and feet at the bottom. Uh, and on the right, this is a, a, a chalice actually used by, uh, by a church, uh, but it's got the sundial inside. You can see the, the divisions for the hours of the day. And telling the time became extremely important for the church to work out what time various offices should be held. And, and so something like this could be used by a priest traveling around to make sure he got the right time uh, to do particular services. And this one comes from Germany, uh, made in 1554. This is rather a sweet little one. Um, it's got a, it's a compendium, um, an astronomical compendium. So it's got a sundial in it. It's got star charts, a calendar, uh, this device on the right here is called an astrolabe, and I'll talk about astrolabes in a moment. Um, and inscriptions, one of the inscriptions on it says, recognize that the shadows divide the time into hours and that time is fleeting. A human life is like the way of a shadow. So it's almost like poetry written on this little compendium. And this is a, another slightly later one from the 18th century, a polyhedral sundial. So you've got uh, different places you can have the the gnomon pointing to the sun and telling the time when you're traveling around as well and you always get these traveling sundials with a compass in them because you need to know which way the is north so you can orientate yourself in the right way and this one is a, another portable sundial um, from the byzantine world from the fifth sixth centuries ad and you can see the, the markings on it and this is a sort of early version of the uh, the astrolabe. Uh, you can, sundials obviously are not very used for telling the time at night, um, but the astrolabe could be used for telling the time at night. Astrolabe it comes from the word for, for star, um, measure of the stars, and you could tell, work out your latitude using your astrolabe during the daytime, and then at night you could point it to particular stars and work out the time at night as well, because particularly for uh, religious purposes, you need to know the time during the night, not just during the day. Um, and this is a, an astrolabe in the British Museum collection from 1236, made in Cairo by Abd al Karim. And it's one of the most spectacular ones. It's a large, very large astrolabe, quite heavy to lift. I'd have never been allowed to lift it, but it, to, I imagine it's quite heavy to lift. And the Arab world became the great inventors of these sort of things during the the early Middle Ages. It's the Greeks who had invented the astrolabe back in about 200 BC and then a lot of their knowledge and science was passed on to the Arabs when they took over the uh, that part of Eastern Europe. Uh, it was calculated by, by the 10th century. The astrolabe could carry out a thousand different calculations uh, used for a thousand different things. Uh, but by this stage, by 1236, it was also a work of art in its own right. And I've got a couple of close-ups here. You can see all these little pointers are pointed to particular stars. 
we've got birds and fish and monkeys and various things to help the astronomer to work out the exact position of the stars and for the time of day and for the, the, the latitude that he was standing at. There's a little close up of the, the monkey. So he's curious today in, in uh, the Islamic world, you, you're not supposed to show these sort of things, but in the 13th century, they were not quite so particular. Is this object at the British Museum? This is in the British Museum, yes. This is, again, one that uh, I include sometimes on the tour when I do the tour of the, the clocks, because it's, it's such a beautiful thing. We use it on one of the other tours. It's in the As New Islamic Galleries, which only opened a couple of years ago. So, um, And how big is it? It's um, it, it's probably about a, a meter across. It's really quite a large. Um, oh wow! Object. It, perhaps a bit less than that. I can't remember the exact size, but it's um, you know it's sort of larger than a football. <laughs> um, that's sort of, that's sort of size. Yeah. Right. Um, other methods of measuring time uh, were one of the other early methods was a water clock. By letting water drip through a hole in a measured basin, you could actually measure the passing of time. And this is very important for Egyptian religion. Again, their priests had to carry out certain rituals and certain sacrifices and so on at certain times of the day. So uh, the earliest one we know of is from the tomb of Pharaoh Amenhotep I, who died around about 1505 BC. Again, this is in the British Museum, this particular statue of Amenhotep I. And the, the name we give for these water clocks is the Clepsydra. And again, this is a, a broken part of a Clepsydra from ancient Egypt from about 320 BC. And you can see on the outside uh, how it's important for religion. You've got the Pharaoh uh, giving offerings to various gods. This is the Pharaoh here giving offerings to another god here with a goddess Sekhmet behind him. And on the inside of it, you've got these measurements which show the passing of the hours during the night. Uh, these work very well as long as you've got somebody to keep replenishing the water. And if somebody forgets to fill the water up, then of course you've, you've lost your, your measurement of time. You have to come back and re recalibrate it. Uh, these are also known in Babylonian world. This is a, a Babylonian tablet in the museum which records uh, the use of a water clock in about 2000 BC, so about 4000 years ago, and a slightly later one from about 600 BC. I don't read. Babylonian cuneiform, I'm afraid, so I can't tell you exactly what that says, but uh, there's only 12 people in Britain who can read cuneiform tablets, so I'm not one of them. Another uh, type of clock was the candle clock, and again this seems to have been a fairly early invention, perhaps not as early as the water clock, but the idea of a candle burning down, you can put measures on the side of it as it goes down, if you make all your candles the same size and the same type of wax, beeswax, um, you can measure the passing of time quite accurately. This is one from Arabic manuscript, which is actually in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. Uh, an Arab scientist called Ismail al jazari who made a, a movable candle clock. As the candle burnt down and got lighter, it went up and you actually had a marker that actually tell you the hours of the day. So quite a brilliant use of the candle clock. And the candle clock became kind of one of the standard forms of measuring time in monasteries in Western Europe. Uh, King Alfred the Great is supposed to have invented a type of candle clock, which was used in English monasteries for hundreds of years. And only monasteries and kings could actually afford the candle clock because beeswax was enormously expensive. And all those early monasteries had beehives so they could have the wax for making their candles. And a byproduct of that was that they could have honey which again was a very rare product and they could make things like mead out of it, which is something they could sell, which is why so many early monasteries became very wealthy uh, with some of these byproducts. But the ultimate goal was to make a mechanical clock. And the earliest ones we know about, again, were in China, there was a mercury powered clock as early as the 11th century. But in the West, it was this chap, Richard of Wallingford, who was abbot of St Albans Abbey, who invented the mechanical clock in about 1330. And this manuscript comes from the British Library um, showing him pointing to his clock. Now it doesn't survive, but uh, some people have tried to recreate it. And you can see it doesn't really look much like a clock to us today because it had, didn't have a face. It had a, a, 
a sort of back plate based on the astrolabe with pointers on it. So he was developing this on from the astrolabe itself uh, with various gears and mechanisms. And it had a verge escapement, these weights that sort of swung backwards and forwards um, to regulate the clock. You notice it's got a bell as well, because the more sophisticated you got, you could actually have a bell chiming the hours. So the monks knew when it was time to go for a particular service. And that's where we get the word clock from, from the Latin clocker uh, or the French cloche, uh, meaning a bell. So it's, that's where. Technically, if a, a modern clock doesn't have a bell, doesn't strike the time, it's called a timepiece rather than a clock. And some antique dealers are very pedantic about this. And if you say you've got a clock for sale, they say, does it strike the time? So it's not a clock, it's a timepiece. So you have to be a bit careful sometimes with some of these people. Right, um, during the, the Renaissance, uh, the, the, the shift moved from the church to astronomers mainly, who started to work out new sophistications for, the, for clocks. And in a moment, I'll take you up the stairs of the British Museum to show you some of the clocks in the museum collection. I'll just say a little about how the clock developed in the 16th and 17th uh, and 18th century. The astronomer who first invented the minute hand was called Jost Bjergi. He was a Swiss mechanic and astronomer, went to work in Germany. He was a friend of one of the greatest astronomers of all time, Johannes Kepler. And between them, they wanted to make the clock so accurate they could actually measure the passing of a star over the, the lens of their telescope in, sec in minutes, see how many minutes it took to actually pass over the over the lens of their telescope. And he managed to do this. He was known as the second Archimedes because he was, was so brilliant. Uh, he also invented the remontoire, uh, which is part of all clocks from that point, which gave you a secondary power source. These early clocks were, were powered by either weights falling or springs turning. And as the weight fell, uh, you had, the time was not regular. It, with slightly different speeds. And if a spring unwinding, again, it goes at slightly different speeds. And by inventing the remontoire, which gives you a secondary power source, that could be powered up by the first power source. And then it, it winds up to a small extent, then wind, unwinds again, and then winds up again. So it keeps it more regular. And he, uh, his clocks were so accurate, they stayed correct to a minute a day, which was pretty spectacular for the uh, end of the 16th century. The, the most important development after that was the invention of the pendulum clock by Christian Huygens in Holland in 1656, uh, which he combined with an oscillating balance spring. And he was inspired by Galileo's work about 70 years earlier. Galileo had done some work on the pendulum and Huygens realized this could be used for regulating the clock. You didn't just have to uh, rely on the gravity pulling the, the weights down or, or a spring unwinding. He also invented a pocket watch, uh, quite interesting. And one of the things he was interested in was trying to solve the problem of longitude. Uh, uh, this is the period when people were going all around the world in, in ships and you could work out your latitude fairly easily using an astrolabe or a backstaff or a quadrant or a sextant. But working out your longitude is, is virtually impossible unless you have a a very accurate clock. And he thought his wonderful pendulum clock would be the way of solving this. But as soon as they test it out, of course, the pendulum doesn't do very well on a moving ship. It goes all over the place, so a complete failure. But he, he had the right, right idea. So that's just the background to, to timekeeping. We're now going to do the, the tour of some of the clocks in the, the museum. Um, was there any other comments before we go on to this? Isabel, you want to uh, say anything? I think that's good. I don't see any question in the chat box. If you, right. As always, if you have any questions, uh, everybody put them in the chat box. Um, because it's not a lot of us, we can also uh, give the microphone um, you know, to whoever wants yeah. to ask a question. But just put the, uh, put the question in the chat box. Right. So the British Museum has about 7,000 clocks, watches, and other scientific instruments. And it's the national collection of, of clocks and watches. And to get there, when the museum's open, you come into the, the main entrance, which I showed you in my first slide, and you turn left up this staircase, 
go to the top of the stairs and when you get here you just turn to the right and you move over to this door over here and the first clock you see is this spectacular clock which is one of the museum's greatest masterpieces and it dates from 1589 and was made by a man called Isaac Harbrecht in Strasbourg and it's a close-up of it here he was commissioned to make a clock for Strasbourg Cathedral. And on the right there, you've got the, the cathedral clock, which is still there in the cathedral today. That was commissioned in 1574. The, the old clock in Strasbourg Cathedral was, was about 100 years old and it was breaking down. They got fed up with it breaking, so they wanted a new clock. And they asked the professor of mathematics at the university, a man called Conrad Dazipodius, to design a new clock for them and then when they asked all the local clockmakers, none of them could actually actually make it. So it, they called in Isaac and his brother Josias from Switzerland, and it was Isaac who actually made this clock. And it was so successful that he made some copies of it to sell for uh, to ordinary people. Now the, the original clock in Strasbourg was about 40 feet high, and the copies are only about um, five feet high so they're much smaller than the original and although they're based on this of the left hand tower here which wasn't actually part of the mechanism you can see the cockerel on the top there um, it includes all the various mechanics of the main clock you see the different dials here for telling you the the, the calendar the days of the year uh, the phases of the moon the position of the sun um, you've got the hours and minute and quarter hours on here they, they hadn't worked out using minutes yet and then you've got these wonderful processions at the top I've got some close-ups of some of these in a moment and it's beautifully decorated as well with, with panels representing the uh, the uh, things like faith hope and charity so here we are this is Isaac Harbrecht became very famous very rich for this and this is a, a paper by Conrad Dazipodius, this great mathematician who worked out this, this clock. And there we have the cockerel uh, from the original clock. It's rather poor condition these days, so he's in the museum in Strasbourg. And there's one other of these smaller versions surviving, which is in Copenhagen, that's the one on the right. But it doesn't work as well as the one in the British Museum. And there we have another view of one in the British Museum with justice, fortitude and wisdom on the left and the mechanics of the interior on the right. And Sorry, can you just? Yes. Uh, Sorry. Know, it looks like you, I was going to ask details about these uh, justice, fortitude, and hope, but it looks like you're going to go into it. <laughs> I'm going to say a little bit about it. Yes, I mean these uh, these are the virtues, the uh, the the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity are on one side. Uh, on the other side, you've got the worldly virtues of wisdom, justice, and fortitude, and those are just you know, so one of hope, one of fortitude. And then on the back of the clock, you've actually got the three fates. Um, so this clock was actually meant to be seen in the round. You could actually look at all the way around it and see this spectacular thing. And it was meant to be a work of art as much as it was a timekeeping piece. The original clock in Strasbourg was there for the, the cathedral to work out the times of day for services and so on. But these, these copies were sort of for private consumption. Um, and is this all mm. engraved or painted? All engraved, yes. These are engraved on, on the, the metal that's sort of um, gilt copper, the, the, the metal, which uh, has been engraved with these wonderful images. That's right. just two examples. I haven't got the others. So that, would have, in, that mm. would have involved um, uh, some, what, silversmith? So, I mean, there's yes. the invented of the clock, that's one thing, but then yeah. they make no, it. No, that's right. I mean, there would have been a a guild in Strasbourg, just as in mo most major cities, that uh, which would have been involved in making the rest of this clock. So Isaac Harbrecht would have just done the mechanics of the clock and then others would have carried out the specifications for the, the design and the, the, the decoration of the clock. Uh, I, I don't think we know. We, they didn't sign their work usually in those days. They, we, we, some people tried to guess the, the design of these, but it's quite difficult to um, pin it down to any particular craftsman of the period. Right. This is the, the, the dial at the bottom, which has the, the days, uh, the saints' days, the calculation of Easter. You can see the sun and the moon and the phases of the moon in the, in the center here. We've got representations of the four great 
empires of the past on the four corners, uh, Assyria, Persia, Greece and Rome. Um, again, this is an overall passing of time uh, that people are interested in. Lots of saints days, so rather than just the days of the week, uh, the days of the year, you've got lots of saints days, so they know when it's a particular saint whose, whose anniversary it is. And that's the interior of the clock, showing you the, uh, the mechanics of the clock. And it's also musical. It plays a tune. It plays um, a tune actually written by Martin Luther, who is quite a surprise considering this was made for a Catholic cathedral uh, that Martin Luther should have been chosen to have this, this his tune involved in it. And I'll, I'll mention this in a moment about the who this is actually made for this this version. Of you can see these four processions on the left on the front of the clock. The days of the week were shown as gods, just as they, they were in the ancient world. And then you've got um, Madonna and child with angels. And you've got uh, the four ages of man striking the quarter hours. And then you've got a little death up here. I'll show you some details of these in a moment. There's the Madonna and child with angels processing around and they sort of bow in front of her before they go carrying on round. And this is when the Martin Luther's Lord's Prayer hymn tune is played when this goes around. Now this does still work, so if you get to the museum you can actually get to hear this, this playing. It's been restored a number of times. Uh, and at the, the top two, as you can see some quotes here from the Bible. O death, I will be the, thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. On the left from Hosea. And the wages of sin is death. On the right from the Book of Romans. And here we've got the four ages of man. Uh, striking the quarters and the, the the old man it was actually one of the magi originally the madonna and child had the, the three magi processing around her um, they got lost at some point in his lifetime and only one of them survives and he's put on here and you can see the back of him and the child striking the first quarter and again when you get up close you can see lots of little details all engraved in this it's a fantastic work of art in its own right and then right at the top You've got, uh, originally, Christ used to come and strike the daylight hours and death struck the, the nighttime hours. Now, death strikes all the hours and Christ just sort of comes out of his little cubby hole and wobbles a bit and goes back again. So it's had a, had a difficult life, this clock. It's thought, it, it was originally said it was made for the Pope, Pope Sixtus the um, Fifth, I think it was, um, but he, it seems unlikely that he would have wanted a tune by Martin Luther. So we now think it was probably made for the Elector Palatine, who was a Protestant. And during the Thirty Years' War, his palace was ransacked by the Catholics and they took various booty back to Rome. And that's how it became associated with the Pope. And it was bought in Rome in 1829 and then sold to the King of the Netherlands, William I, King of the Netherlands. And it then went into private hands and was on show in, the, in London in 1848 when it was offered to the British Museum for £400. Um, the British Museum turned it down in 1848, said it was too expensive. It was then bought by a collector called Charles Octavius Swinnerton Morgan, one of the great clock collectors of the 19th century, who was a, a friend of one of the curators of the museum, Augustus Franks. And he offered it again to the museum for £100. But again, the museum turned it down. Um, when Morgan died in 1888, he left it to the museum in his will. So the museum got it for free, having turned it down twice. Um, so there's a, a moral in there somewhere. Um, but when the museum got it, it was broken. It didn't work at all. And one of the curators at the museum, uh, Mr. Batten, repaired it in 1922 to get it working again. And it's, re and it's been repaired a couple of times since, in 1957 and 1989. And if you want to know what it sounds like and looks like and can't get to the museum, um, you can look at this video on uh, YouTube. Um, if you want to make a note of that, or I can send you the, the link. I'll send you this well, the link and you can get it from. Yes, that would be yeah. great. If you can yeah. uh, please send me the link. There's a comment it. here from uh, Kathy mm. who says that it looks like a much more elegant precursor to the Glockenspiel clock in Munich in Germany. And I've never been to Munich, so. No, I don't know that one. Um, I mean, there are a number of these in uh, Germany. Um, originally, I say a lot of these clocks, spectacular clocks, were made for cathedrals, inside cathedrals. But after, during the Reformation, 
a lot of them were made for town halls and town, various towns. There's one in Hamelin, Hamel in Germany as well, which I've seen, which is a, a sort of version of this. And the, the, the sort of civic pride that these towns wanted to show off that they could afford one of these things because it was enormously expensive to, pr to produce something like this. Um, and there are some still going. So I guess the one in Munich is the same. It's one of, one of those sort of re reformation ones that's still working. And there are various other places. I think the one in Prague, uh, which has one like this huge one on the on the, the town hall. Um, there's one at Fortnum and Masons, which is a much later one and not quite spectacular, but it's a similar sort of thing with characters coming out and striking the bells. Mm -hmm. Right, if you leave that behind you and go in through, through the first room into room 39 in the museum, you can see this ship in front of you. And at first glance, you think, what's a ship doing in the, in the clock gallery? And we're going to be looking at one or two of the other clocks around here as well. And this clock, this ship is actually also a clock. It was made by Hans Schlottheim of Augsburg in about 1585. And again, this came from the collection of Octavius Morgan. And there's a picture of Octavius Morgan uh, in the museum. And you can't, at this angle, see where the clock is. But the, the clock face is actually, I get the point, it's just down here, just about make out a little bit of it. And you can see the, the men in the crow's nest have got hammers, those are the bells to strike the hours and the quarters. And there you see a close up. Uh, this is the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, and he's got a procession round going round him with the seven electors. The emperor was elected by other rulers in Germany. And there's the clock face with the imperial eagles over it. And there's another close up of the clock face and the emperor with his procession going round him. Now, the original of this clock was made by, by Schlottheim in um, 1581 for the Emperor Rudolf II in Vienna. And it was made in silver. And it was so spectacular that other people wanted a, a copy of it. So again, if you were very rich, you could commission Schlottheim to make you a copy. And we think this particular copy was made for the Elector of Saxony in Dresden. And again, it, we don't know what happened to it for a long time. Eventually got into Morgan's collection and he gave it to the, uh, the British Museum in his will. The interior is quite amazing. Um, you can see a little bit here, uh, the bellows and the, the characters on it. Uh, this figure is quite an interesting one. He came up for auction in 1983 at, I think it's Sotheby's, and was bought by a private collector called Rainer Zietz. Uh, the museum tried to get it because it was obviously one of the original figures from the, this clock, this ship. But uh, when he realised, when Ritz realised he'd been bidding against the museum, he gave it to the museum for nothing. So again, it's a case of um, having lost something but gained it for nothing. It was quite good. Now, looking at this interior, you can see it's not just a clock. That's not just clockwork. These are bellows in here. and There's lots of very fancy gear work going on. And what this this Neff, as it's called, which is a centerpiece of the table, actually did was it sailed. You wound up the clockwork and the ship started at one end of the table, sailed along, stopped in the middle of the table. And at that point, the bellows started playing, a little organ started playing a tune. There was actually a drum skin with little drumsticks in it, tapping away the rhythm. Um, there were some pipe trumpeters on board who seemed to be blowing their trumpets. And the, that's when the electors processed around the emperor. And when they'd finished, the ship carried on down to the end of the table. And at the end of the table, it stopped again. And the cannon at the end fired. And then all the other cannons around the outside fired as well. So it was quite a spectacular thing. And presumably everybody cheered and clapped. And then you got on with your dinner. Um, a wonderful centerpiece. But, but if you look inside, it looks a bit like Meccano. Um, it's all a bit sort of scratch built and all hidden by the, the beauty of the ship itself. So it's not uh, the most sophisticated mechanism. And that's why it didn't work um, when the museum first got it. And they've never been able to repair it successfully since. The, it, it was a sort of secondary version. The one in, in Vienna, I say, was silver. And this one was made from copper with gilding on it. And that's the other side showing you again the, this rather strange mechanics inside. A bit of a close-up of the gearing. 
This is the one in Vienna, which does still survive. And you can see it's rather more spectacular. You've got these wonderful sails, painted sails on it. And this one they have repaired. And again, there's another uh, website here on their YouTube site, which I'll give Isabel a session pass on. And you can actually see it sailing down the, the, the floor, the table, and with the, the drummers playing, the pipers piping. And at the very end of it, the cannons all fire. So I can get, can, you can see what the British Museum one used to do, uh, but doesn't do anymore, sadly. And there's a third one of these. Schlottheim made several of these. And the third one is in uh, Ecuan. I'm not sure if I pronounce that correctly. The Musée de la Renaissance in Paris. And that's what this one looks like. Um, there's a close up of it. And you can see this has got far more people on board. You can see the trumpeters and the drummers and other little men on it the emperor over here and inside it's completely empty there's none of the mechanics surviving at all on that one so it doesn't doesn't work at all but still quite a spectacular uh, piece of work uh, it's thought this one was actually made for the ottoman emperor in constantinople and at some point ended up in india and was bought by a collector who then took it to paris this has actually got eight electors on it, so it must have been a late work. By 1623, there were late eight electors for the emperors. So that's uh, how that one got there. All right, so when we if we turn to the left after having looked at the ship, you can see this clock in the case over here, which is the next one I want to talk about briefly. And it's made by this man, Thomas Tompion, who's one of the greatest English clockmakers ever. And it's called the Mostyn Tompion. It's a spectacular clock. And it was made for William III of England who had it in his bedroom at Kensington Palace. This is his, uh, one of his other rooms, his picture gallery in Kensington Palace, which has got a, a wind dial on it, a famous wind dial. You can see his map here. It's got a, a wind showing whether the wind was coming from France. He's always worried about an invasion from the French. He's very interested in mechanical things. But this clock was made for him by Thomas Tompion in 1689, using the pendulum invented by Christian Huygens 30 odd years before. And uh, one of the most amazing things about it is the inside of it is that it only needs to be wound up once and it will go for a whole year. The, the bell strikes 56,940 times over the year. And during that time, it keeps amazingly accurate time. It's the most spectacular piece of engineering. So the total opposite of the, uh, the Schlottheim ship. But again, with this spectacular engraving on it, you can see a close up of the engraving, Thomas Tompion's name on it, hidden from view. And it shows you the days of the week. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Isabel. Hmm. The, um, these um, uh, clockmakers, were they, was it a, a from father to son uh, tradition? Yes, or? very often. Yes. I mean, you had to be a member of the Clockmakers Guild. And it's a sort of closed shop. So you needed to either know somebody, be apprenticed to somebody. Um, usually the, uh, the son would be apprenticed to one of the other clockmakers and learn his trade there and then perhaps go back to work for his father and take over the business after his father died. But yes, there's a sort of fairly closed knit community, just like the silversmiths and the goldsmiths and all the other main guilds in, in London. And I, I guess Amsterdam and other, other cities Does as well have the same. Idea. Does the does the guild still exist in the UK? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I guess it does, um, but I don't actually know. Um, most of these guilds do still survive, but whether they are quite so closed as they used to be, I think you don't have to be a member of the guild, the clockmakers guild, to be able to make clocks anymore. Um, especially as clocks aren't made in the same way quite they were in the past. Right. And, maybe courts and so on, but uh, this is, there's a close up of the, the days of the week. So again, you see the ancient gods, Roman gods being used. There's Mars for Tuesday uh, with uh, Diana for Monday on the right and Mercury for Wednesday on the left there. Is it painted metal? No, that's engraved again as well. This is all engraved on the, on the metal work. It's engraved on the metal? Yes. But the metal is white. Is it just a photo or is it? Um, it's, it's, I think it's um, using the technique of Niello, uh, which is a, a silver, darkened silver uh, to engrave okay. it. 
Um, there we can, even if we didn't know who it belonged to, you can tell it's William III's coat of arms because he's got his coats of King of e his arms as King of England around the, the outside and in the middle of the line of Nassau as he was a Prince of Nassau as ruler of the Netherlands. And some rather wonderful silver work with the Lion of England, the Unicorn of Scotland, Unicorn a little bit bent, poor old horn, uh, and the Rose of England and the Thistle of Scotland again sagging a bit after the, over the last 300 years. But again, the, the clock still goes and we have Britannia on the top. The, the reason it's called the Most in Tompion was because when William III died, he left it to the gentleman of the bedchamber, the Earl of Bromney, who left it to his nephew, the Earl of Leicester, and it went through his family to the Lord's Mostyn. And the Lord's Mostyn had a, a wonderful ritual they went through on, on Grand National Day when the, the race called Grand National was held once a year in Britain. All the staff in their stately home put a bet on the horses and they all wound the clock and each one had one wind of the, of the, the key for the clock because it only had to be wound once a year so they did it on that Grand National Day and one of them won money on the horse and the others all had a fun time. They had lots of partying, drinking and so on. And a lot of us at the British Museum think we should re reinstitute that on Grand National Day, which is all going and winding the clock and having a party. But uh, no one's taken us up on that yet, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and that's the, the Mostyn Tompion. The next clock, uh, we're running out of time, but is that all right if we carry on a bit more, Isabel? Yes, no, absolutely. Yeah, okay. So if we turn around from that, I'm going to walk past this clock, which is the last one I'm going to look at, and past the ship. And over on the other side over here, we've got a clock which is related to this, this search for longitude. This is, uh, this picture is not in the British Museum, it's in the um, National Maritime Museum. Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel, one of the greatest names of an Admiral, Cloudsley Shovel. And he sadly died when his ship was wrecked in 1707, when he was coming back from war against French, uh, when he couldn't tell where he, his longitude was. The only way of telling longitude at the time was called dead reckoning, where you had to measure the time and work out the time from the stars or the sun and work out how far you travelled and try to plot it on a, on, a, on a map. And if you got it wrong, things like this happened. You got wrecked on the Scilly Isles and there's his ships being wrecked on the Scilly Isles. Uh, four ships were, were lost altogether and 2,000 men were drowned. And this is such a disaster that Queen Anne just before she died, passed the Longitude Act, which you can see here, offering a prize of £20,000 to anyone who could solve the problem of longitude. And the man who eventually solved it was this chap, John Harris. And then this, again, this picture is in the uh, National Maritime Museum, which is, as Isabel said, probably other places where I lecture. And the clocks that Harrison invented for it uh, are also in the Maritime Museum. This is his first attempt, and those are his other attempts. And eventually, he produced a clock in uh, 1770, which was copied by another person and take on Captain Cook's voyage. And it, it, to get the prize, he had to, you had to invent a clock that kept accurate time at sea that could be copied by somebody else. It's no good if you were the only one who could make them. Um, and that's how he won the, the 20,000 pounds. But in the meantime, Thomas Mudge was trying another method. There are lots of different methods for measuring longitude. And one was using the, uh, the moon. And this is the clock he produced in 1754, trying to work out the moon methods. And you can't quite see the dials here, but one of them has a, a measurement that goes up to 29 and a half days. If you remember, I said the moon travels out that. And um, he also invented the detached lever escapement, which was used in all modern rich watches right up until the invention of the quartz watch. Um, and his clock was so accurate it remained accurate to 0.2 of a second every 29 and a half days, probably one of the most accurate clocks ever invented. And this is the interior of his, his clock. Bill, there is, a, there is a comment from, uh, from Cathy who says that the clocks right. are works of art, but also functional. Was the accuracy of the timekeeping secondary to the beauty of the clock, which obviously has terrible consequences if it's the case? In different cases, yes. The, um, the Mostyn Tompion and this clock, it was the accuracy of the clock, which was the most important thing. Um, the, with the, the, the ship that I looked at, the clock wasn't very accurate, 
um, and it was just the beauty of the, the craftsmanship, the artwork. So there's a mixture of those, those in here. Um, and so that's the Fromage clock. Mm -hmm. and there's a slightly more uh, interesting, uh, slightly better photograph. You can see the 29 and a half on the dial here to show the, the phases of the moon. You can see the moon uh, going across the top here. Um, he was given 500 pounds or 500 guineas to help him try to work out this method for longitude. And it probably would have worked, but he himself gave up and spent the rest of his life trying to improve on Harrison's clock. And it was Harrison's clock which actually became the modern chronometer and was used by sailors right up until modern navigation techniques uh, to work out where you are at sea or where you are in the world uh, using longitude. Um, but it's why, it, because it was all done in London, this is why Greenwich mean time is, is there, naught degrees longitude is in, in Greenwich and so on. Uh, Mudge did get some reward there. He was made royal watchmaker to the king and queen and given a pension of two and a half thousand pounds for his, his trouble. And the final clock I want to look at is turning your back on the, the Mudge. You can see the Tompion over there and the ship here right in the middle of the room. It's one of the most popular clocks in the museum, one that gets most people around it. And it's called the rolling ball clock. And it was invented by this man here, Sir William Congreve, who was a bit of an amateur inventor. He was best known at the time for inventing rockets. And these are some of his rockets. He used them after he'd seen them being used in India. Tipu Sultan, one of the Indian rulers who was fighting against the British in the 1780s and 90s, uh, used these and Congress thought he could develop these even more and he used them in the war against Napoleon when the uh, British were fighting the French at Boulogne in 1805 and 1806. They even tried to use them in the uh, uh, Peninsula War. Wellington wasn't so keen on them uh, but also he developed rockets for fireworks and uh, used them at the cor coronation of George IV in 1821. But as a sideline, he also, that's one of his rockets still surviving in the museum in Paris. He also uh, had an idea that if you designed a clock and instead of using the pendulum, you used a rocking board. You can see this board here, which rocks backwards and forwards with a ball rolling down it, that this could be an accurate way of keeping a clock regulated. And there he shows you the, the, the time on the clock. The, it doesn't, you can't do it for, for measuring minutes. The, this hand here, which is the minute hand on the right, whizzes round every 30 seconds from 30 to 60. Just whizzes all the way around. And there you can see the rolling ball at the bottom. As you can see, this plate rolls to the left and to the right. And the ball, which you can see there, see here, runs up and down these grooves. And when it, after 30 seconds, it hits this, this spring which knocks the board back the other way and then it rolls all the way back the other way. And there it is in its wonderful dome. And it's probably the least accurate clock in the British Museum. It was a complete failure in terms of, of being able to produce a clock that tells accurate time. So again, answering, is it Cathy who asked about this? This is purely for show. It was, it was nobody could ever use it for actual um, clock. This particular one based on Congrey's rolling ball design was made for the Royal Exchange and it was put in the Royal Exchange as a, a just as a spectacular thing to look at. Um, this one was made in 18, uh, can't remember the date, so, but anyway, 18, 1830 about, uh, by an English maker called French, which I think is rather nice irony that Congrey spent a lot of his time fighting the French and then you have an English maker called French who actually made this wonderful clock and it's in its original case and original dome and it's quite a spectacular piece of glass blowing to be able to create that dome on top of it and uh, people stand for hours watching this go back and forth so if you look on the internet you can probably see lots of people's films on their mobile phone of this going backwards and forwards because it's a, it's mesmerizing terrible clock but a uh, wonderful piece and occasionally these do come up for sale the the comic bob monkhouse owned one of these and when he died a few years ago, it was sold by Sotheby's, I think, for £20,000. So they do come around just occasionally. But uh, bad, bad clock making. OK, that's all I want to say about the clocks in the British Museum. I said we over on the time a bit, but uh, um, Thank you. happy to Maybe answer any questions. <laughs> 
uh, maybe we can stop the uh, the sharing of the screen and go yes, back to uh, yeah, uh, normal viewing. Okay. Great, thank you. So, um, I mean, clearly time has been uh, preoccupying people and uh, civilizations. <laughs> We've for... overrun the time, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still trying to figure out um, how to spend it and how to keep it and how to uh, uh, keep the memories and all that. Yes. Uh, I mean the uh, the the uh, the room at the British Museum is uh, very impressive. I don't know if anybody in the audience uh, has seen it, but it's quite uh, it's quite a remarkable place. Um, are there any questions? Um, yes, Tim. Hi. Uh, I'm Hi. sorry, I look so red in this screen. I don't know why I look so. Red. <laughs> That's my first question. Uh, no, um, I just wondered how with the very early clocks were uh, calibrated because presumably from one town to the next they would have sort of different times I mean this before Greenwich mean time and that sort of thing how did they keep accurate time consistently between localities well they didn't it wasn't until the railways came in the 1840s um you know you had Somerset time was different from Yorkshire time and Kent time was different from Lancashire time you know you, you just you just had the, your local time uh, which you um, you could work out. You could you could set your clock accurately by a sundial at noon because you could see when it was noon, and then you could if it was a bit wrong, you could set it back again correctly because not every clock was as accurate as any other. But you didn't need to know what the time was in any other part of the country. It was only when the railways came in the eighteen forties that, of course, you had to have a railway timetable, and you needed to know how long it would take your train to get from London to Manchester and what time you were leaving, what time you arrived. And it's no good saying you're leaving at such and such a time, London time, and arriving in Manchester at Manchester time. They all had to be the same time. And that's when they started to work out they had to have a, a standard time, a Greenwich mean time. Um, and there's, it, uh, there's quite an interesting book um, called, I think it's called The Time Lady, about a, a woman called Ruth Belleville, who got a job at Greenwich uh, getting the time off the Greenwich clock and setting her own watch by it and then taking it round to various uh, places, uh, institutions in London, giving them the exact Greenwich mean time so everybody could have exactly the same time. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things we don't think about today because it's so easy. But uh, And there's, uh, if you go to Greenwich, you can see on the top of the observatory, Flamsteed's house, there's a red ball which used to go up and down at one o'clock so that all the ships in the river in the Thames could set their chronometers by it. So when the ball went up at just before one and then fell at one o'clock, they could all set their chronometers to one o'clock. So it uh, used to work when I was a child, but I don't think it works anymore, sadly. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you that so much, everyone. Thank you. Next Thank week, you. we are lovely. with uh, Seth Kennedy. And as I said, he's an antiquarian horologer based in um, Hertfordshire. And uh, he's absolutely amazing. His work is incredible. And uh, we're going to be in his studio. We're going to see his equipment work and all that. So that's going to be a, a real treat. So I hope that you'll, uh, you'll join me. Thank you. Have a great day, rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye.